Community Church. Hear the word of the Lord. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. After a few days, Jesus went back to Capernaum, and people heard that he was at home. So many gathered there, so, so many gathered that there was no longer space, not even near the door. Jesus was speaking the word to them. Some people arrived, and four of them were bringing to him a man who was paralyzed. They couldn't carry him through the crowd, so they tore off part of the roof above where Jesus was. When they had made an opening, they lowered the mat on which the paralyzed man was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Child, your sins are forgiven. Some legal experts were sitting there muttering among themselves, Why does he speak this way? He's insulting God. Only the one God can forgive sins. Jesus immediately recognized what they were discussing, and he said to them, Why do you fill your minds with these questions? Which is easier, to say to a paralyzed person, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up, take up your bed, and walk? But so you will know that the human one has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, Get up, take your mat, and go home. Jesus raised him up, and right away he picked up his mat and walked out in front of everybody. They were all amazed and praised God, saying, We've never seen anything like this. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning. In our call to worship this morning, I just want to repeat a couple of the lines. Um, if you haven't picked up on it yet, we're a month into a series called We Are Oak Lawn. And so our call to worship leads us into this series every Sunday. And for the first month, we focused on what it meant for us all to have this identity of being a Guan, of being Christians in this community, looking at what our task is, task is collectively. But right now, in this month, we're focused on this next phrase, you are a Guan. And here's what we mean by that. When you bear witness to and celebrate Christ's transforming power, love, and mercy in my life. So now, as we say, you are Oakland, we're saying what you are to me, what I need from you and what you need from me in order for us together to recognize the power of God in our lives. And then, later in that call to worship, we say, when you help carry my burdens and remind me of my worth. Friends, I hope we're, I hope we're doing that for each other all the time. We are, um, we are a people who carry each other's burdens, not as a burden, but as a call. I invite you to pray with me. God of love, we give you thanks for your holy word today. And God, as we dig deeper, right through that roof, we ask you to be with us. Help us to see each other and to see you in the face of one another. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Today we're focusing on a spiritual practice, and each week of this series we're focusing on a different spiritual practice. Actually, at the end of your bulletin, um, right below the benediction or somewhere in that vicinity, um, you'll find a list of spiritual practices that we've talked about so far, ending with the one that we're focused on today, which is a spiritual practice which starts with the word please. How often do you find yourself these days saying please? God. Please, God, hear my prayer for my brother. Please, God, hear my prayer for my sister, because this is an act of intercession. That's the fancier, more spiritual word for what we're calling please today. So as we talk about what this spiritual practice of intercession really looks like, um, I think this story is quite fitting. This is a spiritual practice of compassion and intercession. And so I want to I wanna define a little more clearly what I mean by intercession. Um, I want to talk about it or think about it as a bridge between our compassion 
and the compassion of God. Being a bridge, being that person who's willing to um, reach out one hand and hold the hand of God and reach out your other hand and hold the hand of someone who is suffering. Our ability to have compassion for those who are experiencing pain and who are suffering and our willingness to be a bridge between that person and God is what intercession is about. I think that in the word please, um, we're given a choice. We are choosing connection over disconnection. I think we all have a choice, right, to, uh, to just be disconnected from those around us. I mean, I think we make that choice all the time, unfortunately. Um, we have a choice to kind of take care of number one and be less concerned about those who might be suffering around us. It's weird that we have that capacity, but I think it comes with the ability to change the channel, look the other way, pretend like we don't know what's going on. We have a choice between compassion or apathy. Apathy is scary. It scares me because I've certainly been there and recognize the moment when I was being apathetic, not really caring. Because, you know, a thing happens when you become apathetic and you stop caring about others. I think you also turn off this ability to experience joy, mm -hmm. and to experience love and the fullness of what it can be. We also have a choice of expanding our love outward and expanding God's love outward. Or really just focusing on the concern of um, ourselves only. So I think that being invited into this spiritual practice of intercession is life changing. I think it's a game changer, not only for those that we are asking prayers for, not only those who are saying, please God, see the suffering of this person, but it's life changing for us. It will change your life when you care for somebody else. <laughs> Philip Yancey says, At its best, my prayer does not seek to manipulate God into doing my will. Quite the opposite. Prayer enters the pool of God's own love and widens it outward. What an amazing notion, right? That God's love can be expanded outward through you. And so if we're going to talk about uh, what intercession really means, I think we have to talk about um, this other big word, and we're going to spend a little time just defining it because it may sound a little crazy. Um, it's this word, theodicy. Okay. <coughs> theodicy is a theological term for um, what it means to ask the question, why? Why could it be that God allows pain and suffering to exist in the world? Why do bad things happen to good people? And that's this theological question of um, theodicy. And I don't have answers. I don't want to um, pretend that you're going to come here and ever just to get all the answers. So if you think that's what we do here, sorry. <laughs> but I will say that I think that when I, when I consider this question, I consider that maybe we are better off not knowing the answer. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're better off not knowing why pain and suffering can happen in the world. Because here's, what's hap here's what happens, I think, or here's what I see happen. When people think they have the answers, mm -hmm. they can distance themselves. That's right. If I know the answer to why suffering happens, then I can say, oh, I'm just going to be a little aloof about this because um, here's the answer. And so I don't really have to care. I already know why. But in the absence of um, logic to explain human suffering, I think that we have to descend from our brains into our hearts. 
And we are a brain kind of people. I mean, not Gretchen, she loves, I mean, she's brainy. She's brainy, but she is like a lover, right? Um, I, I think it's important to surround yourself with people whose instinct is first to love, especially if it's not yours, right? Um, because to descend from our brains into our hearts and actually be led by what our heart is saying is risky. I'm an eight, and I don't mean to ex exclude anybody, but that's an Enneagram term for, like, I'm a doer, I'm a goer, and I think first and uh, act first and, uh, and have emotion later. And if you're kind of person who puts your emotions behind, this is a challenge. This is a challenge to say, what is it to act with my heart first? I think to descend from our brains into our hearts means that we have to look at those around us. Those we'd probably rather look the other way and not see. It means the invisible have to become visible to you. Whoever that is for you. <coughs> and it's important when we recognize that that comes with the responsibility of seeing God in that person. Now I'll tell you, that can be a real challenge when that's your enemy. So I think that when we use our heart instead of our brain, that we move into a space of acting with tears and action instead of just words and more words. And this is where, this is important to me, because as I just said, I'm a doer. Um, this is where that thoughts and prayers mm. Stuff comes in, right? Come on. Come on. So if our intercession only takes place through thoughts and prayers and words and more words and not tears and action, I think we're missing the boat. So here's this good example I think we get in our scripture today. So in the book of Mark, we hear this story that Samantha just so beautifully read. Um, here Jesus is back in Capernaum. Capernaum. And, um, and he's in the home of someone. And here are these religious leaders gathered around with a front row seat, listening, watching for what Jesus is going to do next, what miracle will he perform. And the crowds are gathered around. The crowds are so thick you couldn't get through if you tried. And here is this paralyzed man and his four friends. I don't know whose idea it was first. The paralyzed man who said to his friends, hey, please, this is my last shot. Or if it was his friends first who said, this is it. We've got to get over there. But here they come, these four friends and the paralyzed man, and there's no way they could break through these impenetrable crowds. But somebody had faith. I don't know if it was all five of them or one of them who had the heart to give them that faith kind of pep talk that sometimes you got to give each other and say, look, we love you so much. There's got to be a way and I'm going to find that way. And so they acted in creativity and, um, and innovation and decided they would just go right around that crowd. And climb in through the roof. They couldn't just climb in through the roof without digging it out first, so they tore the roof off of somebody else's house. You can only imagine um, what everyone must have been thinking or saying. And then lowered Jesus, right? I mean, lowered this paralyzed man right down in front of Jesus and all these religious leaders who are probably going, uh, Excuse me? <laughs> but they did say something that made me say that so next um, Jesus said your sins are forgiven and he healed this man and the religious leaders who have this front row seat said blasphemy do you have that authority to go and heal this man to forgive him So I think that Jesus...
Jesus must have been impressed by their faith, right? I don't know whose faith, but one of their faith, or all of their faith. And so this next action took place. And there the man stands up and Jesus says, take your stretcher and go. And he walked out the door. He wasn't lifted back out of the roof. He picked up his stretcher and walked out the door. Can you imagine? These four friends are a living example of, I think, um, the spiritual practice of intercession. I think intercession looks just like this. For these four friends to come to their friend, take him in faith by extreme measures, illegal circumstances probably, Mm -hmm. and lower him right down to the foot of Jesus. Can you imagine doing something illegal to save somebody else? I can. As a matter of fact, we participate in that. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but you probably do if you watch my Facebook very much, but um, we break a city ordinance every time we open for shelter. <coughs> we break a city ordinance even though the city council says to us, we need your help. There are people dying in the street because we don't have beds. I believe it is a spiritual act of intercession that this faith community intercedes. Reaches one hand out to God and reaches one hand out to our neighbor and says, come inside and don't die today. But I will tell you, there's another intercessor. It's a new city council member who I'm extremely proud of right now. She's one who has volunteered with us a number of times at the shelter. And she said to the Office of Homeless Solutions this week, because we've been working on this for three years to change this ordinance. So she said to the Office of Homeless Solutions this week, I'm going to bring my sleeping bag. And others from my district are also going to bring their sleeping bags. And we're going to sleep outside of City Hall until this is changed. Mm. Mm. This week, we will open our first citywide inclement weather shelter. When we practice intercession and compassion, we become stretcher bearers for other people. Amen. Amen. We pick up a stretcher and we carry it to God. That's what we should be doing. I think that's what this is about. How will we practice that as a community? How will we practice that as we bear God to one another? Here locally, but certainly outside of this place. I'm going to, I want to dig into one more, maybe um, unknown doctrine, but maybe you do know it. And this is a doctrine called the priesthood of all believers. I don't know if you've heard of this, but it was kind of a point of controversy for a while um, in terms of a Protestant critique of Catholicism. Um, But priesthood of all believers is this notion that um, this work is your work. This work of intercession, this practice of um, compassion is your work to do because all believers can be about, about this work of Um, being a priestly presence for someone, being an intercessor. I think there's a fear in uh, some of the the Catholic doctrine that this would eliminate the need for a priest. Um, I don't don't see it that way. I think that uh, what it does say is, you don't have to come through me to get to God. You know that, right? I love you, and I will shepherd you, and I will pray for you, and I will wrestle with God with you. But you don't have to come to me to get to God. 
And when you meet people who are suffering, when you meet people who are in pain in this world, I hope you know that that's your opportunity to take their hand mm -hmm. and to take the hand of God and not say, well, I gotta wait a while, it'll be a month or so before we can get an appointment with Rachel. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on. Take their hands and be that bridge of intercession for someone. Mm -hmm. And so this idea of priesthood of all believers is this reminder, I think, to all of us as a community that we are all called to be about the work of love and compassion and intercession all over this world. I can only go so many places. Every place I go is amplified by the number of places that you can go. And the way that we can share God's love just expands outward in this beautiful and magical way, and miracles happen. That's right. Miracles will happen all around us because of our willingness to walk with people, to be stretcher bearers. I have no idea where I am here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Preach. okay. Keep preaching. <laughs> right? I think that... Um, but it's important for us to hold each other because um, being a priest isn't easy. Amen. We might be just as likely as um, those who are suffering or in pain to be too skeptical mm. to believe this is even possible. Mm. I think we oftentimes let our brains get in the way of our heart. <clears throat> and if that's you, don't be ashamed. Find your siblings in Christ who are sitting around you and talk to them. Tell them, I need a stretcher bearer today. Mm -hmm. Will you be mine? Yeah. Oh, that sounds like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay when we need a stretcher bearer too. And so I want to, uh, to lift you all up that um, we can count on each other. You are Oak Lawn. You are Oak Lawn. You are Oak Lawn. And we'll take all of us to do the work that God has for us to do because God has great work for us to do. There is so much love to share. It never runs out. I give thanks to God for this community and I give thanks to God for every single one of you and the way that you are stretcher bearers for our world. Let us continue.